of Matthew. Matthew is part of what we call the gospel in the Bible. So in the Bible, you have 66 books. There are 39 in the Old Testament, and we have 27 in what we call the New Testament. So the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that the Old Testament is about the law. It tells us, you know, what God requires, but what we realize is that uh, while we know what God requires, we can't do it. Have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? Do not lie, do not steal. Have you ever lie? Have you ever steal? Do you always put God first in everything that you do? Do you ever have like any uh, jealous thoughts about other people? You wanting other people's stuff? You see somebody's car, this should be mine. They don't deserve it. And then the Old Testament went on and, and talked about all the Ten Commandments, do not commit adultery. Uh, and what we realize is that God gave the law um, is so that we could know what God requires because God is perfect. It's for us to realize that, hey, I'm imperfect because when I look at the law of God, I do not measure up. Any of you ever kept, let's just think about just the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments are the most popular, but there's over uh, uh, 200 laws that they had to keep in the Old Testament. So if we can't keep 10, how do you think that we can keep over 200? Is it possible? It's impossible. That's what the book of Romans tells us in the New Testament. Uh, we cannot keep the law. Nobody can. And that's why now we have the New Testament, where Jesus comes in the picture. So Jesus is the perfect representation of God. So Jesus is perfect, but we are not. So since Jesus is perfect, and that's why Jesus had to die for us, when Jesus died for us, because the Bible says God is perfect, God cannot see sin, so that's why Jesus had to go and die for us. And now when we receive Christ, we put our faith in Jesus. We say, Jesus, I can't, but I know that you can. Want to help me to be more like you? I cannot do it, but help me walk with you now. God says, okay, I got you now. Now when I look at you, I don't look at your sin, all the bad things that you do. When I look at you, I look at Jesus. Because that's why the Bible says uh, the life that you live now, it is no longer, Paul says, it's no longer I will live, but Christ who lives in me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, uh, we are a new creation uh, in Christ Jesus. See, none of us here are perfect, okay? Um, if you just say you're perfect right now, you just lied. So that just makes you imperfect, Right? Don't look at me like you're all perfect, okay? You want me to go to details about your sin and bring them up? Okay, good. Somebody should be like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, good. So, so we all agree that all of us don't have it all together. So the Old Testament, the way we look at it, it's like a mirror, okay? When you have the mirror, you look at it, it tells you, man, you're bad. Man, you need to do something with your face, Okay? For, for some people, you need like some, some paint, you know, like ladies, you know, that, yeah, that's paint, okay? Uh, guys, you just don't care. You say, man, that hair is ugly, let me just cut it off. You see, that's why you have bald-headed people, okay? So the mirror just shows you and just tells you what you look like. But the mirror doesn't change you, Okay? You have to take some actions, okay? Like, if you saw me yesterday with my beards, it was not a good scene. But this morning when I woke up, I went on and shaved, okay? I'm much more presentable right now as I come to you. But you see, it took action. I had to go ahead and, and shave. So that's why the same, uh, it doesn't matter what we've done, 
uh, how bad we are, when we look in the mirror, we get discouraged. God doesn't want us to feel like, oh, but I'm so bad. Don't feel pity. But God says, hey, do something about it. Jesus died for you. All that you have to do is to put your faith and trust in him. And you don't have to feel miserable anymore. Because now you can live the life that he lives. And that's what the New Testament teaches us. It tells us how to live uh, in Christ, but not trying to live by the law. Does that make sense? Now, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, so that's the Old Testament here, that's the New Testament. For 400 years, God did not speak. For 400 years, the people were doing so many bad things, God just kept silent. We call that the silent period, where for 400 years, God did not say a word to his people. It was just like dead silence. Oh, y'all get very uncomfortable, huh? I just took a pause and don't say anything. That's how it felt. When the people, God's people, were just waiting for a word because God would speak through the prophets. But for 400 years, because they were messing up so badly, God just went quiet. And which brings us today to what we call Palm Sunday, because in Palm Sunday, that's when the good news come. Hey, Jesus is coming. And that king is coming. That's why we see a prophecy in the book of what we call Zechariah. That's the book, one of the first books, you know, right before the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. You have Zechariah, then you have Malachi, the last books uh, in the Old Testament, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold your king. Who's the king? Jesus. Your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. See, that's the prophecy. That's why we worship Jesus when we come here for 400 here when everybody's scratching their head. Where is God? And then God sent a prophecy saying, your king is coming to you. He's righteous. You are not. You've just been messing up. That's why I have not spoken to you. It's kind of like when you mess up at home and then your parents just give you the silent treatment. Isn't that worse than if you just get a beating, like very quickly? And they just, when they're ready to see you, they just look at you. And they don't say anything. Me growing up, give me that beating and let me be free. But when they give you that silent treatment, it's like, what is it going to be this time? What's going to be my punishment? See, that's kind of like how the people were feeling. They're just kind of fearful and what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Until we get that prophecy, it says, hey, your king is coming. Jesus is coming. That's what they refer to as the Messiah. That means the one to come. You say he's righteous and having salvation. Hey, you can't save yourself, but Jesus can save you. You say he's humble and mounted on a donkey. A king doesn't make sense to come on a donkey because uh, in the old days, what do kings would typically ride on? Do we know? Chariots, but what animal? Horses. Horses. Horses are strong, they're powerful, they're mighty. But Jesus, as the king of kings, is coming on what? A on a donkey. That's a lesson for us on humility. It's like we don't always have to show off and showing that, hey, I got this, you know, I, I am this. Hey, look, look at my ride. Oh, look at my whip, right? Oh, y'all know I don't know. I know too. Okay? <laughs> Humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, a little donkey. See, that's the kind of saviors that we, that, that we have. Jesus, hey, he has all powerful, he's all powerful, but decide to 
humble himself. And that's the lesson we have to learn. Hey, because I have money, I don't have to flash it. Okay, because I, I, I am very smart, I don't have to make everybody else feel bad that they're not as smart as I am. You see, that's what Jesus is trying to tell us. And that's why here uh, in this Palm Sunday, it, it's a reminder that, hey, Jesus is here. Jesus has come for us. He's righteous. I am not. That's why I need him. That's why when you see here, we're singing, we're worshiping Jesus because Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. So the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from God. So whatever we have, our good looks, our money, our good clothes, everything that we have, it is a gift from God. And that's why we need to learn from Jesus and be humble. So today, we're going to look at a very strange passage in the Bible. This is the part of the Bible most people usually just skip. Uh, as they go in flu, because it just talks about a bunch of names. That's what we call the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And I've entitled our message this morning, A Very Messy Family Tree. Have you ever seen like a very messy family? None of you? By the time we're done today, you'll realize that there's a lot of messy families around you. And then you'll even come to realize that you also come from a very messy family. There are no perfect family. And we will see that Jesus, although he was perfect when he came on earth, came as a baby. He was not a baby. He was already God in heaven. He came. It's kind of like you have a movie. The movie director can do whatever he wants in the movie. Can he not? He can have the movie playing and decided that, hey, I'm going to get into the movie too. Okay, let me create a character for myself. That's kind of what's going on there. When Jesus comes, Jesus is the author of history. It's, it is his story. History is Jesus' story. So what he does, hey, I'm going to put myself into the story. Here's the plan. Here's the plot. I'm going to come as a baby. I'm going to incarnate and... Just live just like you and I. And then I'm going to show people how to live a perfect life. And then what I'm going to do, since you guys have given you everything to live a godly life, but you keep messing up. Uh, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to come and live for you. Because what did God do? Here's the story of the Old Testament in a nutshell. So in the Old Testament, God created one human being called Adam. And then God said it was not good for Adam to be alone. Then he brought a woman to him and created a woman called Eve that he took from Adam. And then Adam and Eve was living in a perfect place that we usually refer to as the Garden of Eden. But very soon after, Eve was deceived by the serpent. See, God put everything in the garden that was perfect. In the garden, the middle of the garden, it tells us there was a tree called the tree of life, and then there was a tree called the tree of good and evil. But if they eat from the tree of life, they will live forever. The lead from the tree of good and evil, that's the only tree that God says, hey, do not touch this one. Now, some of you will say, why did he put it there then to have a choice? Because without the power of choice, uh, you cannot have true relationship. Can somebody force love on you? Oh, you know, you got to be with this girl, but you, you don't love her. You see, you need to have the power of choice that, hey, you can say, I, I choose that girl. Or the girl can say, I choose that guy. See, the power of choice. Without the power of choice, there's no true relationship. You know, there's no true obedience. So that's why God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil there so that they have the power of choice. Because God did not create us as robot. God created us to have relationship with him. So sin messed everything up. So uh, Eve messed up uh, with Adam. So as they sinned, now they messed it up. The perfect thing that God has created now has been messed up. And then it gets so bad where people got into all kinds of sin. Then God says, hey, I'm going to start over. 
That's where God created the flood. And after the flood, now God just say, I'm going to use now one family. And he preserved Noah and his family. And then through Noah, uh, the moment Noah got on the boat, you know what Noah did? He got drunk. Okay, he got drunk. Now, God still tried to work with us, work with us, but it's just, it's just, just not working. Then, then uh, you get the Tower of Babel. Then the people come in and say, it's like, hey, they're going to try to reach the heavens. That means like they're, they're trying to unite against God. That's why we all speak different languages. Then God confused us and put us like in all different places and parts of the world. Then when God says, okay, I've tried it with an individual, and I've tried it with a family, uh, then God says, now I'm going to use a nation. That's why you hear about Israel today. That's why you have all this conflict in the Middle East. He says, I'm going to use a, a, a nation. I'm going to use a man named Abraham, and through that man, I'm going to start a new country, and those people are going to be what I call my people, the people of God. And God did that, guess what? The nation also, that country we call uh, Israel, just did the same thing also. They kept messing up over and over and over and over what God has told them to do. See, for 40 years, God told them that God was going to move them into a place. For 40 years, they just wandered around everywhere, but never obeyed God. Then that's how now you get what we call the church. That's what we are part of now. God is saying, hey, I tried one individual, I tried a family, I tried a country, and none of them came, came, came flu. God says, hey, I'm going to come myself because Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. God says, hey, I am going to create a group of people for myself. That's why you are here, and that's why I am here. Now we are what we call in the church age, which is the New Testament. So let's look at the genealogy of Jesus. So I've called our message this morning a very messy family. So get ready to learn some very uh, important uh, lesson here. So let's uh, first uh, read the text. Uh, so Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 to 17. So as we're reading, uh, a lot of those names would not make any sense to you. It might seem to be a very boring passage, but trust me, it's not going to be boring. We're going to have a great time, and we're going to learn a lot of valuable lessons uh, to live by. You ready? Let's read. It says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brother, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by the father of Ram. And Ram, the father of Aminadad, and Aminadad, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. That's where you see in the beginning there, it starts with David and Abraham. So Abraham is kind of showing you different uh, generations. Then it says, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah and Abijah, the father of Asaph and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Azekiah, Azekiah, the father of Manasseh, 
and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, uh, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of uh, Shiltiel, and Shiltiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Eliud, and Eliud, the father of Eliezer, and Eliezer, the father of Matam, and Matam, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So I know some of you felt very bad for me reading those names, and you're saying, how do you even pronounce those names? And I know some of you are saying, Pastor Jose, how in the world are you going to preach a message from this? What are we going to get there? But you will see. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. We know, Father, that uh, every word of yours proves true. And we know, Father, that uh, you say every word is inspired by you. And you say that heaven and earth will pass away, but not an iota, not a dot will pass away, uh, but your word will remain. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's the message in a nutshell. God's plan is to take ordinary people willing to obey him and use them to do extraordinary things for him. Why don't you say it with me? God's plan is to take ordinary people willing to obey him and use them to do extraordinary things for him. In case you didn't realize, you are the ordinary people. I am the ordinary people. God is in the business of taking just day-to-day -day normal individuals and turn their lives to do extraordinary things. I want to highlight for you some of the Bible characters that we saw there. There were so many of them. Uh, we will not have an opportunity to look at all of them, but I want to highlight uh, some of them here that are more prominent. So first of all, we saw Abraham as we were reading the text there in the genealogy. Okay, there's nothing fun about just reading genealogies, a bunch of names, but if you are familiar with the name, then you make the connection, and then you will see that, wow, this is a powerful story. So it starts with Abraham. Abraham was a liar. He repeatedly lied about his wife being his sister so that he would not get in trouble, so that as he was traveling, going to different places, so people would not, the, the kings had a way of conquering people and then take their uh, women, because his wife was very beautiful. His wife's name was Sarah. So because he was afraid, although God directly told him, hey, I'm taking you to this place, you're going to be fine. But he did not trust God. Instead, he revert to lying multiple times about his wife, saying that his wife was his sister. So Abraham was faithless. He did not have faith in God. But guess what? Now Abraham is called the father of faith in the book of Hebrews. See, God is in the business of taking ordinary people and, fix, and, and, and when they are willing to obey him, then they do extraordinary things for him. And Abraham, the guy who lied all the time, who had no faith. But it is amazing what God can do with a surrendered life. 
And the same thing that God did for Abraham, he's ready to do it for you too. God is saying, hey, I'm just looking for you. If your problem is lying or you don't trust in God, you don't see any purpose to follow God, God is saying, just what I did with Abraham, I can do with you. Because God told Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. And Abraham could not understand this. He never had any child while he was 90 years old. But miraculously, God gave him a son. And his name was Isaac, as you look in the genealogy as we were reading. But through that, God blessed him. He is the father of many nations. God told him, you look at the stars of heaven, you, if you cannot even count them, that's how great you will be. You see, the liar, the faithless man, God turned him into the father of many nations. Are the genealogies making sense now? Second one, Jacob. He was a deceiver. See, uh, he was twins. Twin, his twin brother Esau. When, they, when his mother was giving birth, uh, Esau came out first. But when they got the, them out, he was holding his brother's heel. They call him a heel catcher. So he wanted to pull his brother down and then to come out first. You see, even babies can be very sinful, huh? See, there are no perfect people. Oh, the baby's so innocent. No. Jacob was a deceiver. He eventually stole his brother's birthright. In the Old Testament, birthright was a big deal. Because whoever was the firstborn get to inherit everything. But you see, just over a meal, he tricked his brother and deceived him and his brother gave up his birthright just for some soup, just for some food. See, Jacob was a deceiver, and everywhere that Jacob went, Jacob was trying to deceive. But guess what? God had a wrestling match with Jacob, and as he fought God, God broke him. Then now God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, Israel, which means governed by God. You see, that's what God can do. God can take a deceiver, a liar, a very dishonest person, and then change him. The nation of Israel, Jacob is the father. If you heard the 12 tribes of Judah, the 12 tribes, they come from Jacob. See, God still. So God is in the business of taking ordinary people and using them to do extraordinary things. Now, next one, Judah. Judah was a very dishonest man. He was picking up prostitutes. And Judah fathered a child with his daughter-in-law. Say nasty. You can say you can say nice thing in church. Say nasty. Yeah. You see, Judah uh, had had three sons. Uh, so his son, the first son, married uh, uh, his daughter-in-law, and as he married her, then for some reason, then he he died. And after uh, he died, the custom was that if uh, the the bro the brother has to the next brother in line has to go marry that wife uh, of his brother so to make sure they procreate for their for their brother so the second son went on and guess what the second son also died now the wife was waiting for the third son but Judah kept tricking her but never gave the other son into uh, marriage. So what she did, she 
dressed as a prostitute. And then Judah came to her and just checking out prostitutes. So he must have had a pattern, a pattern of going to prostitutes. So she knew that she went and dressed as a prostitute and went on. And uh, he had a daughter. Uh, he had two sons with her, uh, twins. Her name was Tamar. So what you see there, is that getting, you seeing the messy family there? It's very messy, right? But Tate, that was Tamar. You can read that in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. That's the first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 38. You can look at the story there. Then you have Rahab. Rahab is called a prostitute in the book of Joshua. Then you have Ruth. She came from a line we call the Moabite. Those people were cursed because they were a product of incest. Say yuck. You can say yuck in church. Say yuck. See, a lot uh, after God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he had two daughters, and as they went there, the two daughters got their father drunk, and then they each take turns different nights and got pregnant by their father. And that's the line that Ruth came from. She was a Moabite. So anybody uh, in those days, when you say you were Moabite, nobody wanted to associate with you. They looked down upon you. But that's who she was. But still, which line, which family line did Jesus come from? A Moabite, a prostitute, dishonest man, a deceiver. Then we get to David. David committed adultery and murder. There's a story. David saw the wife of one of his soldiers, and he wanted her for him, and he got her pregnant. Then he tried to bring the husband home so that uh, the husband could have relations with his wife so that he would uh, show that he's not the father, so he's a liar. But the man was so honest, the man never went home. Hey, he said, other men are fighting in the field. I'm not going to go home until the battle is over. So... When David tried and tried to get him to go home, he still refused. Then now David sent him back to fight, but they put him uh, uh, all the way in the front. And you know who dies first, right? Front line. So David was an adulterer, and he was also a murderer, but God still says, hey, I'm going to still use David. You know what God calls David in the Bible? A man after his own heart. Because he repented and now was walking with God. He realized his shortcomings and now God says, hey, I want to use you. So then you have the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. That's the woman that David committed adultery with. And then out of that, the, the child died. But David also had another son with uh, Bathsheba because he married her later after her husband passed away. His name was Solomon. And that's the line that Jesus decides. Jesus says, hey, I'm going to put myself in the story of history. And, and that's the family line that I'm going to pick. That's exactly what God did. God says, this is the family line I'm going to be in. And Solomon was the wisest man on earth. But do you know wise men can also mess up because they think they know too much? Solomon took 300 wives for himself and he had 700 concubines. That means side chicks. And you guys think you got it all together. So Solomon, Solomon is way ahead of you guys today, okay? Y'all cannot even catch up with Solomon. Okay, but, but that's the family line that God decided to use messed up people. 
And here we will see here, you know, as we look at the story of a mess of people, that's why we see a very messy family. Here are some lessons for us. Here are some lessons I want us to consider. I want you to think about as you think about the story. Can you think of a more messy family than this? It's pretty messy, right? But God says, hey, I want to use some people. But I, I'm going to show the world the power of somebody submitted to me and what I can do through them. So here's what I want you to consider. I, I want you to really pay attention. Here are the lessons. I really want you to take those lessons to heart. They're going to uh, make your life better. They're going to help you, Lord God, not to have just, uh, how do you call that, pity party later on. You ready? Lesson one. Your past and your messy family tree must not define you. Your past and your messy family tree must not define you. You know, all of us have a past, right? Once you come to God, God says you are a new creation. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you decide to follow him, you decide to walk with him. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, God says, hey, you are a new creation creations. Old things have gone. Now you are brand new. So God is saying whatever you've done in your past, it is in your past. And live it right there where it is. Never try to dig down that hole again. Okay? The past is the past and that's why it's called yesterday. Okay? It is behind you. Your past and your messy family tree must not define you. How many of you have messes in your family? If you, your hands is not up, you just don't know. <laughs> Maybe a good thing that they spared you from it, okay? All of us have messes in our family. There are no perfect family. Probably the family you look up and you think they are perfect, they might be the messiest family that you can ever see, but you just, it's just hidden very well. Your past and your messy family tree must not define you. Don't ever let anybody define you by your past. If you decide to follow Christ, you are a brand new creation in Christ. Whatever was behind you, they need to stay right there. Staying in your past. See, you do not have control over the family that you were born into, but you have control over what kind of family tree that you will live behind. Right? Do you have any control over the family you were born into? See, some of us just, 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 get mad, we have a pity party, a party. Uh, we, we, we feel miserable, oh my daddy was not there, oh my mom was, was, was this, my mom was not there. But, but, but God, God is saying, hey, you, you, you had no choice. God says, I chose that family for you. But God is saying, hey, the family you were born in is not the big deal, but it's what kind of family you are going to create. That's what matters. So God is saying, hey, 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 whatever family you were born into, that should not define who you are. You need to move on with your life. God says, I still have a plan and a purpose for your life. The second one is that God uses imperfect people to accomplish his plan. Do you agree? God uses imperfect people to accomplish his plan. You see, Jesus' family tree included a lot of messed up people, right? Lots of morally bankrupt people. But that def did not define who Jesus was. He was the king of kings. He was the perfect savior. 
he walked on earth, never sinned. You see, the family you were born into is just a starting point. It does not have to define who you are. God will use imperfect people to accomplish his perfect plan. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans to prosper you, not to harm you. They are plans to give you hope, and they are plans to give you a future. So God is saying, hey, I have great plans for you. Are you going to get into my plan? I love the way that another preacher puts it. He says, uh, God uses actual people, not ideal people, to accomplish his plan. So uh, what Alistair Begg is saying here, hey, a lot of us want to have like an ideal person in our mind. You know, what they're supposed to be, what they ought to be. But, but God is saying, hey, that, that is not real. Everybody's messed up. Uh, you've never looked at Romans 3.23. It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Last time I checked in the dictionary, the word all means all. That's all all means, right? It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When Alistair is saying God uses actual people, it says, there are no ideal people. The perfect person you have in mind does not exist. So God is saying, hey, you act actually use actual people, uh, not ideal people. Uh, ideal people. You see, God knows how to reform those who submit to his will and use them mightily. If you would simply submit your life to God, you will be shocked and see what God does with your life. See, here's the thing. God uses the broken, not necessarily the best. God uses the broken, not necessarily the best. See, once you realize your need for God, last week we looked at the poor in spirit, the people who realize their need for God, that means we were broken. Now God can and will use you when you are broken before him, realizing that, God, I can't. I don't have it all together. And God, I need you. See, God has a way of turning messes into masterpieces. That's what God does. You've never seen anybody just, just painting. You look at when they start. It doesn't look like anything. It just looks like a mess. And then you just give it sometimes as they keep working on it, they keep putting the dots together and they keep filling the holes, the void there. And then all of a sudden now you see a beautiful masterpiece. That's what God wants to do in your life. Say so you might start in the family where you were born into, you just get a blank canvas or you get a broken canvas with messes all around but God has a way of shaping it into the form that God wants it to be. And God says, hey, you see that, that, that messy family you came from? Uh, you see the mess that you've done in your past? God says, hey, I'm going to connect all of it together. And I'm going to turn all that big lump of mess. And I'm going to turn it into a masterpiece. So that what he did for Paul, the apostle, who wrote most of the New Testament uh, Saul was a persecutor. He used to persecute Christians. He used to persecute the church. And, and he probably even committed a murder. It seems like, you know, one of the early disciples named Stephens, they stoned him to death. Uh, history has it probably Paul was the one who uh, commended that execution. Oh, he was there. But God uses that man, even changed his name from Saul to Paul. Because God is in the business of taking messes and turn them into masterpieces. Third lesson that we need to learn from this is that the heritage you receive is not as important as the legacy that you will leave. The heritage you receive is not as important as the legacy that you will live. 
See, all of us will be known for something. See, if you're known, you know, by the family you came from, or people say, oh, you're from the Delta. When you go outside of uh, town here, uh, like looking at people who are from the Delta, uh, down on people from the Delta. Oh, oh, you're from Mississippi when you go to another state. Oh, Mississippi. See, Jesus was born in a town like the Delta called Nazareth, in Bethlehem, Nazareth. You see, one of the disciples even said, can anything good come from Nazareth? Oh, not just good, great things can come from Nazareth. Same, can anything good come from the Delta? Oh, yes, great things can come from the Delta. You see, God has a way of associating with the little people that the world call. The people that the world look on and see, uh, uh, there's, there's nothing. You see, there's nothing significant here. There's nothing significant. Well, why would you stay there? But God says, uh, that's what I specialize in. I have a way of taking uh, nothing and turn it into something. And something good. Amen? See, all of us will live a legacy. It doesn't have to be the family, about the family we were born into, but it's about what we decide to do today. Today, I want to create a family that will honor God. Why don't you take 30 seconds now, think about it. What kind of legacy I want to create? What kind of family that I would like to live behind? Father, may you help us to dream big dreams that will live a great legacy that honors you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You see, your legacy is what matters. You do not have any control over your past, but you do over what you build. And here's the last lesson I want us to learn this morning. The family line of Jesus was ethnically diverse. The family line of Jesus was ethnically diverse. Some people want to make Jesus as a white Jesus with blue eyes and long hair. And others want to make Jesus as the black Jesus. But Jesus, uh, as Jesus came on earth, his family tree was of mixed race. It was diverse. So whites cannot claim Jesus just for themselves. Neither can blacks claim Jesus just for themselves. Jesus was for everyone. That's why it says, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Did it mention that a specific race there? It says whoever. Rahab was a Canaanite, and God used her in the family tree of Jesus. Ruth was a Moabite from a family that was cursed, but she married Boaz, a Jewish man. And from that line, we have Jesus Christ. And some historians even say Tamar was a Canaanite also, saying that uh, the wife of Uriah, was not also Jewish. But those two, we know for sure they were not. But you see, that, that, that's what God does. God created everyone. So why should one race be superior to another, uh, one inferior? So God is trying to tell us no race or ethnicity is inferior to another. None at all. We are all Precious in God's eyes. God knows all of us and we all belong to him. So here's the message uh, in a nutshell. It says, despite our background, our failures, our shortcomings, the power and the grace of God to change and renew is still available to us today. 
because God wants to use you to, to bring good into the world. Why don't you stay with me? Despite my background, my failures, my shortcomings, the power and the grace of God to change and renew me is still available today because God wants to use me too to bring good into the world. Now let's say it like you believe it. You ready? Despite my background, my failures, and my shortcomings, the power and the grace of God to change and renew is still available to me today because God wants to use me too to bring much good into the world. Do you believe it? Are you sure? All right. So I have two questions for you. Are you willing to be obedient? And are you willing to have a fresh start with God? And if you decide to do so, the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you don't know Jesus, you've never given your life to Jesus, all that you have to do is just call on his name. Jesus, I don't understand all this thing, but please help me to walk with you. That's it. And God will give you a fresh start. And if you're already a believer, now God wants to use you. And if you're just being a passive Christian, all that you have to do, God, here's my life. I put it into your hand. Do with my life as you please and help me to be useful to you. So I don't know which prayer you need to pray this morning. Why don't you go ahead and talk to God right now? If you don't know him, call on his name. Help him to come into your life. If you already know him, just ask him to use you for good. Why don't you pray right now? Father, thank you for the opportunity to call upon you this morning. And as each one of us have called upon you this morning, we know that you will answer. And Father, help us to keep those lessons in mind today. Knowing that our past, our family tree does not define us. Knowing that though we are imperfect, but you can and still want to use us. And the family that we came from is not what's most important, but it's the legacy that we will build ourselves. The family that we will leave behind is what matters. And knowing that, Lord God, you are for all people. We all belong to you. So, Father, we thank you for this great opportunity. And as all of us have prayed here this morning, I pray, Father, that you would receive our prayers, whether to take greater step of faith with you and walk with you, or just having a fresh start, getting to know you and living for you and for your glory. Thank you, Father, for each one of us that are here today. May you be magnified. May you be glorified. And help us, Lord God, to keep these lessons in mind and live by them, Lord God. May none of us, Lord God, let our past or our family tree hold us back. May we make no more excuses, Lord God. We are the way we are because of the family we came from. But Father, today, may we make a determination to honor you and walk with you. For you say we are fearfully and wonderfully made in you. So Father, may we be strong in our identity in you. And not be shaken. May you be magnified and be glorified in everything that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.